Hey y'all, welcome to Brianna Approved, a podcast for people who like a holistic approach to real science and clinical research on all things nutrition, botanicals, and balance. I'm your host, Brianna Diorio, clinical nutritionist, herbal practitioner, and recovering super spaz. Welcome back to the Brianna Approved podcast. We are on episode nine and I am titling this episode, Herbs for Anxiety, and I'm actually dedicating this whole week to Super Spaz Week. As you may or may not know, I am a recovering Super Spaz, which means this is a part of my lifestyle, it's part of who I am, and it's something that I deal with a lot. I try and make light of the situation, but you know, anxiety is really common, and it's something that I think has become more and more a part of our daily lives for better or worse. But I also think it's kind of gotten a bad rap over the years. So on today's episode, of course, we're going to do our fun fact of the day. But we're actually going to break down what anxiety is, why it's not all bad and how it can actually be a form of creativity. And we'll talk a little bit about the link between sleep disorders and, you know, psychiatric disorders that can be comorbid with other lifestyle factors such as sleep. Talk a little bit about emotional recalibration. And then we will do a quick nerd alert on herbal psychopharmacology. And then the main, main segment of the show is going to be botanical brie, where I go into six different botanicals and herbs that can be really great for supporting anxiety. And now it's your time for the fun fact of the day while I sip cafe. Did you know that anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the U.S., affecting 40 million adults over the age of 18? So that's a pretty big number. We know that, you know, a lot of these anxiety disorders are somewhat treatable at minimum and at best i would say are manageable through some dietary and lifestyle pieces however only about 36.9 percent of people who say that they suffer from anxiety are actually receiving treatment so there's a lot of things that we can do again because anxiety does develop from a complex set of different factors of course there's genetic factors and brain chemistry stuff going on with you know neurotransmitters But there's a lot of personality and life events that we choose to participate in that can make anxiety more prevalent. It can maybe make it worse for us on a day-to-day basis. And so we know that, you know, everyone experiences stress and anxiety at, at one point or another in their life. The difference between them is that, you know, stress is mostly a response to a threat in the situation, while anxiety is a reaction to the stress. So this can be internal, external. A lot of the times with anxiety, it is stressors that we're making up. And actually, you know, there's a lot of different forms of anxiety. You know, there's PTSD, there's, you know, social phobias, there's generalized anxiety, also known as GAD. That's actually the most prevalent and the most common. About 33% of Americans have generalized anxiety. However, women are twice as likely to be affected as men. And those who have generalized anxiety often experience other comorbid issues such as depression. So there definitely is a link between anxiety, depression, even sleep issues. So it is really important to, again, take a step back and think about what are some other lifestyle factors that can be contributing and making this worse. So we know that if you actually like look up the definition of anxiety from the Merriam-Webster dictionary, they define anxiety basically as this uneasiness or this nervousness that is anticipated or impending for an event. Basically meaning there's kind of just like this overwhelming sense of apprehension and fear and, you know, things that are, you know, impending. They haven't necessarily happened yet. Maybe they already did happen in the past. But a lot of the times when we're dealing with anxiety, there are actual physical signs of it. So we can experience, you know, tension and sweating, increased pulse rate, right? Uh, because of things like, you know, adrenaline and epinephrine and cortisol. And then a lot of the times there is a very big mental component, right? So it's mentally distressing. However, we we can think about anxiety as kind of like a language of the body. It's how your body can communicate with you. 
And a lot of the times, anxiety can be like your body's way of throwing pebbles at you to be like, hey, listen up before it throws a big rock or boulder at our head. So as Oprah calls it, you know, whispers from the universe. These can be whispers from the body that maybe something's not going correctly that maybe we should pay attention to, right? So emotions in general can be these biological signals that can nudge us in a certain direction, tell us if something is working or if we need to course correct. And so, you know, I I say that anxiety is kind of like the proverbial junk food for our mental diet, if you will, right? So yeah, junk food every now and again is fun and it's great to indulge in, but much like if we eat too much of that, we can feel crappy and it can kind of be a wake-up call for us to say, you know what, maybe every time I eat X, Y, Z, I don't feel good. Maybe time I, every time I have this certain thought or I hang out with this person or I, I engage in this behavior, my anxiety flares up, right? So understanding your triggers for that is going to be important as well. Again, because you know all anxiety isn't necessarily good or bad but it's this myriad of physical and mental expressions so it can be triggered by a lot of things it can be triggered by internal stress external stress when we perceive a threat when our you know our mind makes up a story a narrative that we uh, attach to right or something that happened earlier in life these experiences that can actually influence parts of the brain because we do know that part of the stress response is located in our central nervous system. So things like the hypothalamus and the medulla and the brainstem, right? So when we are having a perceived threat, our body is getting ready to start that stress response. It's starting to release neurotransmitters and neurohormones. So that's when we can quite literally feel anxious and we might have, you know, those physiological symptoms in the body, which then can further elicit more of an emotional reaction as well. And many times when we have, whether it's, you know, anxiety or if it is depression, these are symptoms of imbalances in the body, not necessarily a disease. So we don't need to, you know, go and slap a label on it. A lot of these, you know, mind-based health issues such as anxiety, depression, had a lot of its origin in the mind. However, they're both very normal components of our daily life, feeling anxious, feeling depressed, feeling sad, right? All of these emotions. And and basically, there's lots of opportunities in any given day to feel anxious or depressed. And many times it comes from this sense of, you know, dissatisfaction that we've based on expectations that can lead us to feel a certain way. So it's kind of like this micro suffering that we put into our lives. And it doesn't always have to lead to this entire catastrophic event. You know, anxiety, if we can kind of change our mindset on it, you know, it's meant to challenge us and and to evolve us. Stress in general, right? Feelings of uneasiness. These things are meant to move us forward on some level. Most changes that happen in life are often predicated by uncomfortable situations or uncomfortable feelings, right? They're prompts from our body, whispers from the universe, like Oprah says. And we need to just try to disassociate with labeling it as anxiety or saying, I am anxious, right? They're they're moments of emotions, just like that anything can pass. And so it does take conscious work on your part, right, to deal with it about addressing the mind, of course, and then looking at, you know, dietary components and lifestyle pieces. But this is where we should focus on emotional recalibration, right? So if you're finding that periods of, you know, rest and relaxation are not sufficient for rebalancing the stress response in your body, you're going to have chronic overstimulation of that fight or flight response. So we do need to kind of reframe and recalibrate what's going on with our emotions. There is an herbalist known as Todd Calcott, and he actually brought to light a really interesting spin on anxiety. He talks about anxiety as almost a form of, you know, needing to work on creativity. It's a reversed form of creativity. So your body's kind of just looking for a way to release creative pent-up energy, if you will. Because if you think about it, if you can sit there and imagine and make up all of these different painful, sad, anxious scenarios in your head, well, that's technically a form of creativity, right? You're like creating a storyline, you're creating a narrative. And so it is this kind of imaginative creative act, although it's not necessarily super helpful. That means that you also have access to this creative energy that can be worked about in a different way. So I think a really great way to deal with it is to do something that you can just have fun with, right? You don't have to be perfect, um, maybe using your body in more of a 
a somatic way where you can discharge that energy. So movement, you know, walking around, going to the gym, dancing, any of those things can be ways to kind of, you know, creatively use that and energy and use some of those emotions again to, you know, think yourself into a situation that's maybe a little bit more serving for your mental health. Before we get into nerd alert and we actually get into the botanical brie section, I do want to touch on the idea of kind of the chicken and, and the egg situation of sleep and anxiety, right? Like, am I anxious because I can't sleep or am I not sleeping because I'm anxious, right? So they very much co-mingle and interact with each other. And we even actually see this with depression. So things like depression, anxiety, insomnia, they are very common comorbid psychiatric conditions, meaning that a lot of the times if you have one of these, so if you experience insomnia, you likely experience bouts of anxiety or bouts of depression, right? And again, things like anxiety and depression, if you go and look them up in the literature, it basically just lists out different symptoms. So, you know, maybe inability to focus, um, you know, dysregulated moods, uh, you know, spacey head conditions, right? So these are all just symptoms. And again, symptoms of imbalances. So these links between, again, depression, insomnia, anxiety, these are all, again, kind of interconnected. And we know that research is actually showing that anxiety can cause sleeping problems and sleep deprivation can cause anxiety disorders. So it's really interesting that about, you know, 9 to 15% of people in the world in general suffer from anxiety and then layer in something like, you know, depression or other, you know, mental psychiatric illnesses that are going on. We know that this sleep disruption in general is present in pretty much all psychiatric disorders. So they have found that people with chronic insomnia are actually at a higher risk of developing an anxiety disorder because a lot of the common denominators that are implicated in these kind of, you know, psychiatric issues are things like, you know, neuroinflammation, dysregulation of the HPA axis, dysregulation of our neuromodulators and neurotransmitters, overactivation of the fight or flight response. So we do need to understand, you know, which one came first and maybe what is the best approach to dealing with that from a kind of bird's eye view. Next, we are going to get into nerd alert. Nerd alert. So these are two terms that I think are really cool and I think are interesting to learn about that are relevant not only to this show, but understanding some of the underlying mechanisms that can be implicated in what's going on with some of these mental distresses that we experience. So the first word we're going to go over today is herbal psychopharmacology. So we're going to we're going to break that down. I don't want anybody to get anxious about learning a new word. But in general, the field of, you know, psychopharmacology basically studies all these different substances with these various psychoactive properties, right? So focusing a lot on these chemical interactions within the brain. And so if you think about a psychoactive drug in general, right, these are chemical substances that can actually change how the nervous system functions and results in alterations basically in our mood, our consciousness, perception, cognition, behavior, right? So what's interesting is that some of the botanicals and herbs we are going to talk about can do that. They actually can change how the nervous system functions. And so these constituents, these plant compounds, these chemical constituents that are found in some of these botanicals can actually induce changes in mood, in thinking, in behavior. And a lot of the times they are derived from plants. And then sometimes they're chemically synthesized in the lab, right? If we're taking things like, you know, benzodiazepines or you know, sleeping medications, these are actually working as psychoactive drugs that can change how a system functions in the body. And as I've always said, the goal is not to just evade feelings of, you know, anxiousness or or a poor mood or, you know, having a day where you're feeling melancholy. It's understanding that we're trying to to alter an entire system, how the parasympathetic system expresses itself, how the sympathetic system expresses itself. And so that's where we also have our second part of our nerd alert called parasympathomimetics. 
So parasympathomimetics are basically substances that stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. And in case we forgot, the parasympathetic nervous system is that rest and digest, that relax mode, that feed and breed mode. So these parasympathomimetics, such as kava and lobelia, two botanicals we're going to talk about today, they basically, they take your reactivity to adrenaline. So when you have that anxious experience that you're going through where you feel jacked up, right? They actually take it down a notch or two so you can handle more before your body starts to physiologically break down. But they're not necessarily sedative in nature, something like, you know, uh, valerian root, which can really kind of, you know, take you out. So they don't necessarily treat the stress or treat the anxiety or treat the depression. They treat how your body responds to the anxiety, to the stress, to the secondary effects of adrenaline, epinephrine, cortisol, right? And so you need to take these for a while. And before we get into botanical brie as well, I do like to remind people that rarely does one botanical fix an entire body system that is dysfunctioning, right? So just like if you're out of shape and tired, you can't work out just once or eat just one salad and think things are going to be sick. It takes a while to become less well, just as much as it takes a while to become well. So as always, we have to give time time. And none of these herbs or botanicals individually are necessarily the holy grail. They are one tool in your health toolbox, right? And so many times we have to take a big picture approach. We have to look at dietary components. We have to look at lifestyle components and ask ourselves even how much are we contributing to this? What are we allowing to stay in our lives? What stories are we making up? So it is multifactorial. There's a lot of layers that go on. But so today we're going to focus on things that can support systems in the body. But again, you still have to do the work. You have to do the boring work. You have to identify your triggers, where you're contributing to. And ultimately, you have to be ready to make those changes, which can take some time and take a lot of work. And now it's that time for Botanical Brie. As we know, a lot of people approach the conversation of herbs and supplements and botanicals as what are they for? So for example, someone might say kava is great for relaxing you and making you feel good. However, I want to focus on the conversation of what do they do in your body? And then you can talk about what they are for. So we are going to focus a little bit about, you know, what system is it addressing? What imbalance is it addressing? And who is this botanical for? Because again, not every herb is going to be for every person. You have to know your individual type, your constitutional type, and then you can pick protocols according to that. Our first botanical that we are going to talk about today for dealing with anxiety is going to be lobelia. Lobelia is very interesting because it can actually stimulate the 10th cranial nerve aka our vagus nerve. So it can help to stimulate the parasympathetic response or put us into kind of that relaxation mode. So it can decrease adrenaline basically in the body and it can really help conditions that can be aggravated or caused by adrenaline stress. So if you're like running on adrenaline, again, because of the relaxing effects that it has on the parasympathetic system, We know that the parasympathetic system is also necessary for things like being able to digest our food, if we have GI issues, if we have hyperactivity in adults. So lobelia can have a broad implication on dealing with some of those issues as well that can be secondary to not always being in that rest or digest mode. So if you're having issues with digestion, nervous stomach, maybe irritable bowel stuff going on, um, lobelia can be helpful for that. I will note that It should be in fresh plant form when it is a dry version of it. It's more of an emetic, meaning that it can make you throw up. Um, It actually used to be used for that in in great doses. So we want to make sure that we're trying to get a fresh tincture version of Lobelia if possible. But its main mechanism of action is that it does decrease adrenaline. So very beneficial for anything from anxiety, right, to actually relaxing our intercostal muscles. So this is why you might also see it in a cough formula or a respiratory formula. It's really good at relaxing the thoracic cavity and opening up the lung capacity. So it can help you, you know, actually 
If you have a constricted diaphragm or constricted lungs, it can help you expectorate. So good for things like asthma, right? Um, and then there's actually an alkaloid in uh, lobelia called lobeline as well, which looks similarly looks similar to nicotine. So some people have even used it for stopping smoking. So really interesting. It's um, energetically, I, I like to always talk about, you know, herbal energetics. It can be nice. It's a little bit warming and cooling and it's a little bit bitter. So again, it's going to help you chill out. It's got pretty broad usage. Um, it can lower adrenaline levels. You might also see it for people who have implications with neuromuscular issues going on, right? So maybe a sleep formula because it can help blood flow. If you're really anxious and tense and your muscles get tense because of that, um, it can again put you into that nice relaxing state. Um, maybe if you're thinking too much before you're trying to go to sleep or if you're trying to like, you know, focus a little bit more, lobelia might be the botanical for you. Next, we're going to talk about kava, which is one of my absolute favorite herbs of all time, not only because of what it does in the body, but because of the history that it has, the culture that it represents. I mean, historically speaking, kava, it's not just a beverage or a medicine, it's a ritual. Kava by itself is a ritual, which is so, so beautiful. It's used in a lot of different cultures, everything from, you know, births to marriage. They used to have war kava. It's used as, you know, a ceremonial beverage. They used to use it at the beginning and end of political conflicts. So it's been used for like informal situations and social events. And it's a lot more than just a plant. It's a medicine. It's a ritual. It has deep history in the Pacific Islands. And so there's, you know, there's talk about kava actually being drunk before, you know, different social gatherings. And in Hawaii in particular, they call it awa, which means bitter. Um, and it was a considered a, a sacred drink of importance. So very, very cool. The botanical name itself, kava, it actually translates to intoxicating pepper because it is a member of the pepper family, which actually gives it that spicy and numbing feeling that if you've ever tasted fresh kava, it actually like numbs your mouth. It's very bitter in taste. But that also is what helps to give it some of those warming and drying properties when you take it. So we've talked a little bit about nervines in the past, but kava is one of those relaxing nervines. So it's become very popular over the years for those who experience nervousness and anxiety, people quite literally getting on your nerves. But what's nice about kava is that it's not a sedative, so you can take it during the day. You can take it to kind of just like take the edge off if you still need to, you know, do work and kind of become present. And so most of the relaxing effects that kava possesses are due to something called kava lactones. So this is what has the sedative properties and the anxiolytic properties and the antispasmodic properties. Again, that can help kind of just calm us down. It's nice and relaxing. It's very good as well for elevating the mood and sensory perception. So it can work on the limbic brain. So if you're under a lot of emotional distress, right, and you might notice that, you know, your thoughts are kind of scattered and you can't focus, um, it can be very good for the mind and kind of the body for relaxing things down. And it can actually inhibit MAO enzymes. And so these MAO enzymes basically are enzymes that break down neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine in particular. So it can work on making sure we have those nice levels of dopamine and serotonin, and it can work on GABA levels. So nice and relaxing. Again, it's like relaxing the mind and body. I explain kava to people as being like 1.2 spicy margaritas deep. You know, you're starting to feel like a little bit more relaxed. You can engage in conversation a little bit more. You're kind of finally coming out of your head. Really nice for promoting sleep. If you have any pain, maybe that is associated again to elevated cortisol and elevated adrenaline levels. Very good for that emotional stress forward. It can kind of calm you down and be relaxing without dulling the senses. So it's going to help focus your mind. If you feel like when you're stressed out, you get very scattered brain, you have a lot of emotional and mental nervousness, maybe you have insomnia from thinking too much, kava is going to be for you. And I do want to let people know as well that, you know, there was some uh, 
you know, adverse reports that came out of Germany back in the late 90s saying that, you know, kava is can cause adverse reactions in the body, elevated liver enzymes, et cetera, et cetera. And what people should know actually is that this was inaccurate and there's been a lot of misinformation about kava. So I do want to address that here. So what had happened was there were members of the American Herbal Product Association that actually hired an independent toxicologist to look at these adverse reports that came out. And what they found was that people who had adverse reactions to kava had elevated liver enzymes due to other over-the-counter medications that they were already taking. So a lot of these people were taking benzodiazepines, drinking alcohol. They were also taking a patented version of kava that had, uh, I think it was about like 80% kava lactones. That's an extremely high number. So, you know, don't necessarily... Um, take that too deep because, again, the contraindications and the cautions that came about with kava, um, you know, it wasn't accurate. So just so you know that if you do see that on the side of a bottle. But again, I like to call kava kind of like your herb that allows you to take a deep breath and bring you back to the now, make you more aware. And it's just a really nice plant for the anxious times that we are living in. Next, we have lemon balm, which is another one of my fan favorites. My mom loves lemon balm. She, she goes through like a tincture of this a week, but lemon balm is beautiful. You'll actually see it in the summer, so you can probably get some fresh lemon balm from like your Whole Foods to make your own tea from it. And it comes from Greek meaning honeybees. So the lemon balm genus Melissa officinalis, and legend has it that beekeepers would actually crush up lemon balm in the hives to encourage nesting with the bees. But what's really nice about lemon balm is that it's a cooling nerving. So it's a part of that mint family, which is nice because it can kind of cool off some of that maybe inflammation we have going on in the body. Over time, it can help to restore nervous system functioning. So it can actually work on getting us into that, you know, rest and digest mode. It's also a nice carminative. So if you're somebody who gets an upset stomach because of stress, lemon balm might be really great for you. It can relieve some of that digestive upset that can be, you know, like I said, related to uh, some of that stress stuff that we have going on. A lot of the volatile oils that are found in lemon balm um, are really nice. Citronella is actually one of them in there and citru citrol. So these themselves have really nice antibacterial properties. So lemon balm is antibacterial and antiviral, again, implicated for somebody who maybe um, gets sick when they're stressed out. But topically in the summertime, you can put lemon balm onto things like insect bites. So you can kind of rub it on there. And energetically, lemon balm is pretty cooling and drying in nature. It's got a lot of those antioxidants and it's said to uplift the mind. And so it's really good for, you know, your spirit and your mind, very good for soothing anxiety and nervousness. It's said to gladden the heart. It's actually known as the gladdening herb, which is really nice. Um, and again, very good for people who maybe have stress-related symptoms that are expressed in areas of the heart. So like heart palpitations, high blood pressure, um, lemon balm might be the botanical for you. And then we have three more botanicals we're going to talk about next. So... I want to touch base on skullcap. I think I've talked about skullcap before, but again, this is another great herb. It's part of the mint family. Really nice um, for that person whose mind just will not quiet down. If you have this feeling of kind of like being stuck, if you have this sort of like constant state of stress that leaves you feel like tense and exhausted, maybe you're having actual physical pain in the body from that as well. So very good for people who, you know, feel quite literally tense from stress. Uh, herbalist David Winston will actually say that a skullcap person is that person who like flies off the handle when they're stressed out. They can just, they just kind of can't control their stress levels. So really good for nervousness, um, very good for relaxing the nervous system, tense, tension, anxiety. It's bitter and cooling. Again, so think of that person who's like hot headed. It can kind of calm them down. And if you again are somebody who's just like generally excitable, you maybe you're very overstimulated, you're very stress forward, panic attacky kind of person, very good for, you know, acute situations where you like just got off the phone with 
United Customer Service and you need to calm down. And then, you know, for some more chronic situations as well, if you have prolonged periods of stress going on, if you feel like your nerves are constantly on edge, um, Skullcap could be great for you to keep on hand. Passionflower is such an amazing botanical because it actually looks like what it does. If you look at passionflower, not only is it a beautiful herb, but it has these like wound up tendrils. So it's very good for that person who's super wound up. If you're very tired but wired, you kind of can't shut down your mind or body, you might be a passionflower person, right? Because passionflower can actually help with GABA levels in the brain. So help with things like anxiety, think about overly thinking situations, maybe the ADHD, um, anger, digestive issues, very tightly wound up type A people in their head overthinking. All of my super spazzes, passionflower is a really nice long-term tonic. I will usually add passionflower to any tea that I make at nighttime with some other things like I'll do passionflower together with lemon balm and chamomile and it's just it's so nice and calming and relaxing and you can drink it throughout the day. It's not going to totally knock you out or sedate you. What's interesting about passionflower and why I love taking it before bed is that it can actually work on a part of our brain called the medulla obligata, which that's a part of the brain stem that oversees sleep. Um, and as well as some temporary fluctuations that we might have in blood pressure that are due to stress because it can work on that vagus nerve. So again, very good for that person who's got a lot of irritation in the brain and the nervous system, where for them it's manifesting as not being able to sleep because maybe they're working too much, maybe they're overworked, maybe they have palpitations, maybe they're just like quite literally exhausted from all the nervousness. And so over time, it can really strengthen the nervous system. Very good for people, like I said, who kind of have that inability to turn off that internal dialogue. They got a lot of chatter, internal chatter going on. Um, And again, somebody who's maybe like just feeling exhausted because of all that and they're feeling overwhelmed. That's going to be a passion flower person. And then last but not least, we are going to talk about hops now. I wish that I loved beer because hops are actually a really amazing herb. They have such amazing, relaxing properties. I don't love beer. I think all beer tastes like Miller Lite. However, hops themselves are really great, again, because it's cooling and it's drying. And again, very good for that person who is like hopped up on life. Super spaz forward. Maybe they have a lot of muscle tension. And because they're so hopped up from a female perspective, they might also have very intense cramping during their period. Again, because they have a lot of nervous tension in the body, they have a lot of pain, they have a lot of digestive distress. So hops is very good for people who have intense personalities and very strong emotions that can result in things like worry and insomnia and nervousness. We see hops in a lot of formulas before bedtime. So very good for insomnia kind of issues that are expressed for people who are maybe overthinking, but also really great as a digestive bitter. So it can really, like I said, help for that hot type of person, that hot type of insomnia who struggle to fall asleep because they're restless. And because it is a bitter, again, it's one of those aromatic botanicals. It's very good for digestion. So if you're having stagnant digestion or weak digestion, maybe you have a lot of gas and bloating going on, hops itself, because it is so bitter, can help to stimulate bile production, um, help you digest fats a little bit better. So again, if you have indigestion that is associated with nervous tension, hops might be the person, the, you might be a hops person. So a good, very good for relaxing things. So I hope this resonated with all of my super spazzes out there. Again, you know, being a super spaz is a way of life and there's a sliding scale. We learn to deal with it every day and there are definitely things that we can do and herbs we can take and lifestyle and dietary components. And I hope that this was helpful in kind of, you know, bridging that gap for you and creating some more clinical correlations for what might be helpful in your healing journey. And I look forward to seeing y'all in the next episode. Ciao. Ba da 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 two.